Welcome, everybody. I'm Steve Grubbs, CEO of Victory XR, and today we have a very important webinar for you. This is the webinar that helps you to understand the steps that you go through to, to learn how to teach in VR, to take your existing course and to port it onto a Metaversity campus or into a Meta classroom. And so to help us get there to understand that, because I've never done it, we have two experts with us today. First, we have Dr. Lucina Morris, one of the original pioneers for teaching on a Metaversity campus. She's actually going into her fourth semester of teaching on the Morehouse College Metaversity campus. And uh, she's the director of Morehouse Metaversity. And then second, we have Melissa Brent, and she is the director of education for Victory XR. And she's going to talk about the professional development micro certification that we go through. So uh, we're going to try to get through this in 10 to 12 minutes so that you don't have to spend too much time with this and just jump right into it. So let's go ahead and start. Dr. Morris, what advice and suggestions and recommendations would you give to educators who are just starting to figure out how to take their existing course and teach it in a meta campus or metaversity? First of all, I would like to tell you that one of the first things about being an academic is making sure that you understand what your class is about. And we do that. So we do that due diligence already. So for my fellow educators, do not be afraid to already know what you know and use what you know to power the experience that you're about to give your students. So one of the first things that I felt were, was really important for us to do as a cohort was to establish the course that it works the best in. So as professors, we teach multiple classes, but you need to establish what course it works best in. And by, by when I say that, I mean, what student learning outcomes come from this particular course? How much activity that is engaging, that engages auditory, visual, and kinesthetic learning have you put thought to already in your class? Those courses are the easiest to then implement in virtual reality. So if you start to think about how these activities that you already do can be tethered into this virtual reality space, it'll make it more fun, more engaging, and easier a lift for you to do. So when I started thinking about teaching my advanced in organic chemistry course, I knew that there was one particular student learning outcome in section that we always covered first. That was molecular geometry. And students had to understand the molecular geometry of molecules. Well, we use molecular modeling kits usually in the real world to try to help students understand this part of the lesson. Instead of using molecular modeling kits, we decided, hey, let's go and have our students build their own molecules in virtual reality. So when they started to do that, then they would get the same type of engagement, except for this time, instead of them being very tiny little models, they could blow these models up as large as the room. They could spin them around. They could lock them in place. They could use these molecules and react with other molecules, but they could see the symmetry better and they could engage more. And then we thought about location. Okay, that's great. But do we want to do molecular modeling in the same sterile setting that we do in the real world? Absolutely not. So where did we take them to space? How else would students be able to engage with uh, the molecular world than in space? And so they didn't have to go through any astronaut training or anything like that. But we got a chance to give them the experience of being in space, uh, the place where all of the elements began. And they were able to create their own molecules with no space limitations. And they were able to construct things and then talk about them while we were all in this synchronous platform in the room. So it was a wonderful learning experience, but you have to kind of think backwards. So think about what your student learning outcomes are, the activities that go along with those things, and then work your way backwards. And don't be afraid to be creative about it because the more creative you are, the more engaged the students will be. Even thinking in terms of what type of media do I want them to see? Did I want a slide deck? Did I want um, 
360 videos? Did I want to take them on a field trip? Those are things to really think about what place they have. For me in that particular course, I chose to create videos that I put on YouTube that I then streamed into the course, but they were no longer than five minutes because you don't want to do anything that is going to be replicated really on Zoom well. They could watch videos on Zoom. So if it's an instructional video that's going to give them the steps that they need and they get to see your face streaming in, then that's great. But you don't want to give them something that's going to be duplicatable on Zoom. You want to give them something that's going to give them instruction to go through the activities and invigorate them for the exercise. So think about all of those things and strategies and tools that you can use. Do you want students to work in groups? Do you want to pair them in particular ways? Do you want different seating in that space? All of those things, the same things that you would think about in terms of constructing your classroom layout and setting, you can do it in virtual reality. You can do it much easier because it's easier to lift chairs than we are. So Dr. Morris, obviously no educators or professors have any experience teaching in VR. I mean, almost none. How does somebody go from knowing how to teach in a real world classroom to knowing, learning how to teach? What, what did you do in your fellow professors at Morehouse? So there's this company by the name of Victory XR that has these really wonderful professional developments. And um, I really, really like that because what you need to learn about teaching in VR is less of what you already know. You know how to command the room. You know how to get your students' attention. But what Victory XR is going to provide you with is how to make your avatar have that same presence, how to make you come alive in that space where you're not feeling very coy and shy, but that your avatar demeanor is the same as your professional professor demeanor. So that was really important for us to make sure that we were assessed in how we moved, how we walked, how we held our tablet, you know, that we were very poised and practiced in a sense. And so now Victory XR has this wonderful professional development program that Melissa Brent will talk about. Melissa, why don't you talk to, if somebody wants to get their micro certificate for being a virtual reality synchronous educator, what does that process look like? Sure. So it starts with being a subscriber, ideally. The more immersed you can get in all of our products and the more time you can spend with our resources is really how you're going to be like the best teacher you possibly can. So once you're subscribed, you can actually go through our micro certification program for free. And in that process, we tackle three main topics. We go over the tech. So we teach you how to use the tools. We teach you how to use your headset, teach you how to use your hand controllers, walk you through the process of even taking courses and, and leading courses and engage. Um, all of that is taken care of as far as the very, very basics of VR. Then from there, we also incorporate all of those classroom management tools. So as Dr. Morris was saying, you already know how to teach, but there is that tiny added element of all of a sudden you have lots and lots of little avatars running around. So how can you make sure that you can maintain order in a new environment? It's the same as, you know, field trip etiquette, only you're taking a field trip into VR. So we have lots and lots of teacher tools that we go through, you know, how to um, adjust your voice volume, how to mute and unmute, how to seat and unseat, you know, give your kids or adults the opportunity to learn in a comfortable, safe environment, same as you would in a classroom. Those are the two main components. The biggest component, however, of our PD is going through exactly as Dr. Morris was saying, how to translate your course content into virtual reality. We don't want to use VR for the sake of using VR. We want to use VR to improve every single aspect of a part of a lesson. So we want those activities to be better by using VR. That's the type of thing um, Dr. Morse was saying as far as scale goes. You can really take those 3D objects and make them massive. You can stand above them and look down at them. You can you know, sit on top of an elephant. These are the types of things that you can't do in real life. And that's what VR is for, is to give them those learning experiences past what you could possibly do in brick and mortar. So our curriculum meetings that we hold um, with our instructors help you to kind of integrate and to think of your lessons through that lens. How can I improve what I've done in brick and mortar already by using these VR resources? And in addition to that, we talk about our assets. So we have all of our 
resources that we even have available. We have our 3D objects. We have 300, 360 degree videos um, where you can visit in our little field trip bubble. Take your kids there in the middle of a lesson. We have 2D video content that we've prepped. We have pre-programmed experiments that you can, you know, work in ways that you might not be able to develop on your own. But the possibilities are seriously endless as far as what you can even set up yourself using our 3D objects. So with our expansive library, we have more than 7,500 um, assets in general, combining all of those different topics. And from start to finish there, you can really spend some time getting to know what we have. And then it kind of inspires you to create things on your own as well. So through PD, we tackle all three of those areas, the tech area, the classroom management area, and how to translate your curriculum effectively. So Melissa, just to be clear, creating a framework around this, they mm -hmm. have some reading material, they yep. have some videos to watch, and then a so practicum, is that right? Correct. So there's a ton of asynchronous content, 2D videos that can be watched at your leisure. Um, you actually don't even need headset for those, but we also have in-headset practice. So once you've watched your 2D videos and got your sea legs, so to speak, kind of understand the ins and outs, we suggest spending as much time in your headset as possible to go through these practice points, use these tools in real life before even standing in front of a classroom. Um, and we test that in our live practicum. So once you've had the chance to watch all these videos, to do some in-headset practice, you come and speak to one of our professionals and exhibit some of these skills. So they can kind of guide you through if you stumble a bit using a sticky note, you know, that's what we're here for is to kind of guide you through that process and that practicum. Once you've, you know, achieved all practicum, gotten all of that out of the way, passed both of them, our preliminary and advanced, you've earned your micro certificate in virtual reality education. Wonderful. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Morris, okay, we have, uh, we figured out what we're going to have in our class. We've gotten our micro certificate uh, and the day has arrived. The students have gone through their orientation provided by Victory XR, and here we are. We're going to teach our first class and our second class. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that actually happens and, and some suggestions on, on helping students through that process? One of the tricks of the trade, and I don't tell anyone this, but I'm going to tell y'all. One of the things that I did that I found was the most powerful was when they got their headsets at the beginning of the semester and we did their onboarding with Victory XR where everyone got to learn how to use the controls, how to move around. That was great, but I usually don't plan a first class for a week or the two weeks in between there. And during that time, I tell them in our class to play, use it, use all the things that are in that headset. But most of all, go back on their campus, create their own sessions and learn how to move around, learn how to teleport, learn how to be the host even of the session. But I give them the power to explore. That way, when we get into the classroom, they have gotten their own sea legs. They have played all that they need to play and have gotten all of the sillies out. And now they're ready to really lock in and engage. And so another thing that we do is the day of our very first class in virtual reality, even though we don't use Zoom to teach a lesson at all, we use Zoom for our tech support for students. So we'll have tech support in terms of we use Zoom so that just in case you have any problems or any issues with by this time, I didn't see any, um, but we start there and then we lock in all together and mute our Zooms so that we could just hear one another in the headsets. One, it gives beautiful pictures of all these wonderful students in the headset on Zoom that you could use later if you're recording it. And two, it also gives students an, an out. And so they feel very safe in that space, knowing that, okay, if something happens, I could get to Dr. Morris in another type of way. So we start off in our headsets all locked in together. And the first thing I do is manage them. So learn how to use your classroom management with them and show them ways in which you can go and explore a space. Yet I'm gonna bring you all back in. 
to this space. So I'm going to summon you all. I'm going to show them how to use their own tools well. So when I say pull out your idea or what idea you have, that means that I want to see a sticky note. If I say, hey, what do you think this trend looks like? Then you can use your 3D pen and you can draw your trend right next to you and rotate it so that I could see it. Those are all the things that you want to do in establishing ground rules for how you will hit the ground running in the next iteration of the classes. And then after that, just learn how to have fun with them. Let them see you in your scholarship and in the, your new lane, failing forward, laughing together, because truly it's about discovery, curiosity, and finding that joy in education where you're in engaged and they're engaged. So once you've done all of those things with them, you're, you're locked in. Oh, and another thing that I did, if you get very nervous and you think I might not know how to do this, always do a dry run in your headset the day before as your own avatar. Record yourself doing it and then play yourself back. I was so nervous my first class that I did that. Mm -hmm. And I actually played it during the class. And I sat in the back as my real avatar, live and in person. And I paused my avatar that was given the session. And I, what I realized was I also had a teaching assistant. I had two of me in the class and the students thought that was a brilliant idea. So there's so many tricks to the trade that can help you when you kind of have nerves and you're not really sure. But I was pleased with that recording and it got us through our first few sessions too. But then on, I did it just, you know, you know, as my own self, but they felt like that was a really cute idea. And I felt like it was a really relief <laughs> to have myself already knowing that I'm going to do everything well and I could pause myself and stop myself and then walk around as my now avatar and answer all the questions and engage with the students. And then when I wanted to go to another piece of the lesson, press play again. And then my avatar that I had pre-recorded was moving around. So there are a lot of little things that you could do like that. Where else can you clone yourself than in virtual reality? It's beautiful. I I have never heard that story before and I love it. Okay. It's a masterpiece. So we have one minute left. So Dr. Morris, give me the one minute answer to this question. Tips and tricks on building your avatar before you go into your metaversity class. I always use a face enabled avatar. My thing is don't waste too much time. They've had upgrades to it. You can change your color shading to what you want. They have new hair and outfits, but have fun with it. And uh and then make sure you also change your low poly avatar. You could do that too. So switch to your low poly avatar. When you say face enabled, would you explain that to people? So you have an opportunity to pull all your hair back, get in good lighting, take a selfie of your full face, and then upload it onto the Engage platform. And it will create your avatar off of your own face. So what my students really love is they created their avatars, not with a face enabled, but they just created their avatars with whatever they were able to choose and select as a nose, eyes, face. But when they saw me and they hadn't seen me in so long, like, can you imagine a bunch of avatars running to you to like hug you because they, they finally see you and you're you? That was the joy of, of doing the face enabled avatar. So I've just remained with that feature. And I think it's a brilliant feature that I'm that's awesome. Hey, Dr. Morris, thank you. Melissa, thank you. I thank hope you. this has been very helpful for all the educators who will be watching this. And uh, we will be doing another one very soon. Awesome. Take care, y'all. Bye.